And starting at verse 1, so it's quite a short passage. I'm reading from the good old NIV, the nearly infallible version. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Saviour and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have wandered away from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they, they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their parents, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those who practice homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Father, just bless, bless this word to us now as Tony comes and brings it to us. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Steve, for your prayers and uh, stepping in and helping out. It's... Um, as you know, Yona should have been here this morning. Just to make sure of that. But um, he was double booked, so he's invited me along. So it's an incredible privilege, but it's also a big responsibility as well. And um, I would actually like us to, can we do the creed? Uh, so I, can I just invite you all to stand and we're gonna read the creed together. Let's just make this a declaration into the heavens to say this is what we believe as God's people. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father, before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in the glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, and acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Right, let's hope I press the right buttons. Do you like my tablet? Right, so make sure I've got the right password. Well, hey. So.
Let me just pose you a question here this morning. Who are you listening to? What determines your world view? Is it what you see on the television, on news stations, YouTube, Google, Facebook, and all kinds of other things that I don't even know about, like TikTok? Or is it the Word of God? Now, if you say the Word of God, um, I'd ask you the same question. Who are you listening to? To the preachers here on Sunday, or others found online? How many of you listen to preachers online or other other preachers? I do. Don't be, don't be shy. I think a lot of us do. And, and that's great, you know, to be able to do that. But how do you know that what you're hearing is sound teaching? So hopefully your knowledge of the Bible will enable you to do that. So if you read it and you study it and meditate on it, um, then you can decide what is true scripture and what is not. So I hope a lot of you are spending time uh, in God's word. It's not something to be neglected because you'll end up like this. It says in Ephesians 4.14, As children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And you know, sadly many Christians are being deceived by false teachers, particularly in a lot of the American churches, these mega churches, and in many UK and Europe, European churches as well. And that shouldn't surprise us, should it? Because Paul warns us in this uh, in Timothy, he says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will de depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And Paul, we know, was an apostle. He, was, he had one of those that anointing from the fivefold ministry gifts. And he had a responsibility to help people to grow. So he... In Ephesians we read this, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That is God's desire for each and every one of us. Now Timothy, and this was written to, had spent um, many years with Paul on his missionary journeys. He'd, he'd spent three years in this church in Ephesus with, with Paul. And, that he ha and Paul had this really wonderful relationship with him, didn't he? And, um, and all that he learned was equipping him, and he gave him, now gave him authority to confront these false teachers in this church. So Paul was certainly fulfilling that role of uh, equipping Timothy for service and producing a mature believer, and eventually a, a church leader or oversight. Now I can think back to my early years as a Christian, I was disciplined by, by a minister called Alex Ross, uh, an Anglican minister, and he helped me to uh, do teaching on evangelism, he encouraged the development of, of preaching in regular preacher workshops, and he gave us a hard time, I can tell you. He included me with um, uh, planning of citywide events. And then, one stage he came to me and said, would you like to train for the ministry? But I knew that wasn't for me. Uh, that was not my calling. And to minister outside your calling, uh, you won't be spiritually successful. Now my prime fivefold expression is an evangelist and secondary, I'm a preacher. I'm not a shepherd. Now, Alex uh, supported my application to become a missionary in, to Brighton. Did, did you know you could have missionaries in your own hometowns? That's marvellous, isn't it? So I was a missionary to Brighton. And when I, was a set, uh, when I set aside in the church, he prayed that I would be winsome. Do you think I'm winsome? Don't answer that. No. But I actually like it. It's almost prophetic, isn't it? It says, win some. Yeah, I like that. So... Um, so anyway, uh, Alex was a real equipper of people. And um, not just through preaching, but teaching and practical uh, hands-on ministry. He was really following the pattern of Jesus, which is very simple. Jesus said, watch me, accompany me, now go and do it. Now, uh, Alex is the main uh, expression from the fivefold. He was a teacher. But I would have seen his secondary uh, expression as apostolic. 
He, he's always wanted to push the work on, planted churches. He was able to galvanize uh, leaders across uh, the, the city of Brighton in outreach. And if he'd have been in a New Frontiers church, they would have classified him as an apostle. Now, Paul obviously recognised Timothy's gifts. I think Timothy, we would have seen as a shepherd teacher. And where our minister at uh, Shrub End, we actually have a prophetic uh, edge to our ministry. That's with Jo, my ministry partner, for nearly 10 years. And she has a prophetic gift. Her secondary one is evangelism. But that prophetic gift has led the work down there in Shrub End, and we've seen some amazing uh, answers to prayer. And that's developed into a number of ways, including the prayer for Colchester, which we're involved in. And interesting, one of our recent prayer prayers, because we pray uh, every morning, and we were praying for Christian students in Paxman Academy to pray and to meet together. I don't know if anyone, anyone received the CYO emails or reports? Does anybody receive those? Just one, lo no, two lone hands go up. <clears throat> well, I'll just remind, <coughs> excuse me. So see why I report that in two senior schools that has happened. The students are meeting together to pray and study the Bible. Now I don't know whether that's Paxman, but it is an answer to prayer, isn't it? And we want to see that ev in every senior school in Colchester. And you know, we have some wonderful conversations at our cafe that we run on a Thursday. One lad of about 13 came up to me well, a few weeks ago and said, oh, why did Jesus die? So I was able to tell him that, able to give him a book, explained it in a little bit more detail. And this week, he came up to me again and always hanging around, he takes books away and he said, oh, well, this book's really helped me. He said, I believe God's got a purpose for my life. That just really blesses me, you know, that this guy is 13 years of age, is seeking after God. Now, actually, last Sunday, I uh, joined with uh, folk from six other churches praying around the walls of Colchester. And Priory Street is a very interesting street. Have you been down there? Well, so within a quarter of a mile, there's a Roman Catholic church, a synagogue, a spiritualist church, a coven, and a mosque, all competing for the souls of people and keeping them in darkness. And at the end, there's the ruin of St. Boltoff's Priory. There's almost a prophetic insight, isn't it, into the state of our nation. Do you know, I'm thankful that uh, we belong to a Bible-believing church. And I know all those that come and uh, preach and teach up here uh, say that we have a responsibility to ensure that truth is taught. And I think we've been invited to, you know, to, well, to challenge them. Don't do it while they're preaching. But if you ever have any problems, then you need to chat to them afterwards. And I'm sure they'll be able to help you. I mean, Do uh, Jonah told us uh, that he loves to listen to other preachers. I mean, I do. And that, I know that's true of, of Kevin as well. It's like iron sharpening iron. But a wall of caution if you tune into God TV. There are some good teachers and there are some false teachers. And Paul's letter uh, often addresses false doctrine, isn't it, church? And I think Yona mentioned some uh, false doctrine uh, last week. And I think that's part of what, what we're going to look at here this morning. He gave me uh, just one verse to preach on from this passage, which I assume was one he was going to preach on. And we don't know exactly what Paul was preaching against, but I think at the end in verse 620, he warns about Gnostics claiming superior spiritual knowledge divorced from the word of God. And that's what a lot of theologians do. So there's this false teaching uh, and a wrong understanding of how to preach the law. And he says in verse 7 that these, these so-called preachers don't understand and what they're seeking to affirm. And all, in, in his letters, Paul always stresses that he's an apostle and that he has, an, uh, and he's given that authority to Timothy to confront these false teachers. Now, I was just thinking during my time in Brighton, I sat under many, many ministries, under a number of uh, ministers, and I can't remember once ever speaking to one and, um, about their teaching. But I did lock horns with others at different times. <clears throat> 
and I was at a, a mayoral function once and I met the chaplain to the mayor and I was sharing with him something I'd learnt from the Ephesians that morning and his, his response amazed me. He said, you don't believe all that, do you? It's all allegory, it's all myth. So I suggested he got a new job where he couldn't damage people's eternal destiny. And that was the first time I came across this concept of what is called allegorical understanding of scripture. So I've always been taught to take the plain reading of scripture unless it's obvious not to take it. So I'm not, I don't go around plucking my eyes out. And just give you an example of allegorical teaching, just a, a bit of an example. Uh, if you take a, you can take a literal application of, say, the th thousand year reign or an allegorical one. So those who believe it allegorically say oh, they don't believe it. Uh, they not, don't take it literally. It's an unspecified time uh, relating, and, and we're in that period now. And Revelation tells us that during that time, Satan is bound. And that's what they believe. I mean, hey guys, look around. Satan's really active, isn't he, at the moment in the world? You know, that was reflected in our prayers late, just recently. So, um, so if you speak to a, a, a Jewish rabbi, their great hope is the return of Jesus to establish his kingdom here on earth. You speak to Messianic Jews and they would say exactly the same thing. Uh, you speak to ministers who have a sound understanding of end time prophecy would say exactly the same thing. And to allegorize that particular scripture, you have to allegorize dozens of scriptures in, in the Bible. So in my Bible, if you went through it, you would see I've got MR written alongside certain texts and there are dozens of them, and they all relate to the end time period that provided a prophetic insight into that period. And you'd love to know where that all came from. It was a, a, a theologian called Oregon. He developed, in, developed that theory in the second century. And that was, um, I think believers at that time were teaching that Jesus was going to return soon and who's going to overthrow all the governments of the world, including the Roman Empire. And that could have led to the persecution of Christians. So, the the so Oregon decided, um, yeah, th th this is talking allegorically. So he was compromising the real, the real word of God and was suffering the consequences today. Now, another minister I locked uh, horns with, who was briefly on the city mission team, said he uh, had proved beyond doubt that the gifts of tongues had ceased. And as one has, has used as, has that gift, and I know a number of you here do as well, um, I totally disagreed. And I, I remember saying to him, uh, thank God we don't get to heaven on the basis of our doctrine, because if that's the case, none of us would. And that includes me as well. And that, again, is false teaching, goes right back to one of the theologians, Augustine, around about the 4th century. And it's interesting, that minister who, who said that came to faith in a Pentecostal church. But I suspect that he'd seen error and deceit, as I have. But I don't throw out the gifts of the Spirit uh, with the bathwater. And gifts can be counterfeited and misused. You may have heard me say one of these stories before. There was a newly ordained Pentecostal pastor, and he was, you know, he believed in all the gifts. And uh, at the midweek meeting, there were two ladies who were, who were particularly helpful. One gave a tongue, and the other interpreted with helpful advice of how he should run the church. Eventually, he did cotton on. Now, doctrine is important, isn't it? You know, but ministers will differ. But that shouldn't lead to what I call splits and divisions. A prime example is the powerful ministries of Wesley and Whitfield. And they differed on the subject of free will and predestination. predestination. Both were used mightily by God and they remained good friends. They were, but what united them was the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, at, when he, in his opening salutation, speaks about the command of God. And he expands that in verse 5. And it's a clear reference 
to love being central to all that we do. And that reminds me of God's instructions to Moses. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commandments and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. And that's true for us today, isn't it? You know, we, we would obey the Ten Commandments and, um, and to obey, you know, God's rules in every area of lives. I was recently listening to a Messianic Jew who was doing a series of uh, Messianic teachings on Paul. And I thought, well, that, that could be helpful. And he was very helpful. Then he started beating up Christians. He says, Christians believe in a replacement theology, which causes uh, anti-Semitism. I said, well, I don't believe that. Christians don't believe the law is for today. I said, well, I don't believe that. And then, then he went on to say that... Um, we're in rebellion against God if we're not kosher. So I tuned out. So if we serve and eat a prawn cocktail with a belly of pork, we're actually in rebellion against God. Well, I, well, I, I don't believe that for one minute. However, he did make a, an interesting observation. He said that 90% of students who went to Bible college were out of ministry within five years. And when I was on the city mission, one of our team was a Baptist minister. And he shocked me once by saying that 95% of Baptist ministers were no longer in ministry after 10 years. That's incredible, isn't it? And I, at that time, I just made the assumption that they hadn't been called to ministry. And if you're not a, a call to ministry, no amount of training regardless of how many degrees you have, will equip you to be effective. But then this Messianic Jew suggested that the reason that uh, was that theolo theological colleges sow confusion in that they present different and often conflicting doctrines. So in the end, they don't know what to believe or teach. You know, and I thank God I never went to theological college. It would have done my head in, I tell you. Now, I have a simple approach to preaching. I don't consult commentaries, but pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guide me. And today it's a little bit different because uh, Jonah asked me to preach on one particular passage. But when I, so when I prepare a talk, I don't look at commentaries, but I do look at afterwards to make sure that I'm not preaching heresy. And I'm often encouraged that, that what I preach matches up with the commentaries. Now, I'm actually currently reading a book. It's called Creeds, Councils and Christ. And what the guy's talking about is how he's defending the foundations of our biblical faith and exposing how liberal theologians are separating practice in church from scripture. So, for instance, liberals will say the Old Testament is a historical story about the Jews and has no re relevance for us today. And they undermine the New Testament by questioning sources, authenticity and authorship, among other things, and seek to create a divide between the New Testament contributors. So they will say that Jesus, John and Paul taught conflicting doctrine. And I honestly believe that liberal theologians are responsible for the decline in most mainstream denominations because they deny such things as the virgin birth, the miracles of Jesus. And was it a con coincidence that the liberal Bishop of York, David Jenkins, who spoke about the resurrection of Jesus as a trick with bones, so three days after he was ordained as a bishop, lightning struck York Cathedral. Do you remember that? Yeah. You know, was that God speaking? Let me just give you a, a little scenario. A theologian declares that the office of apostle and prophets have ceased. A spokesman from a new frontier church would say, you are in error, we recognise apostles and prophets. So, you know, you're in error. And they are essential to our ministry. Another denomination would say, we don't recognise apostles, but we send missionaries and, uh, and uh, pioneers. 
the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church say we believe in apostolic succession, which refers to this unbroken line of ordination. And there's a quote here, I'm going to read this from this book. It's one of these, um, well, liberal theologians. He says, if we are to distinguish the doctrinal dimension from the myth mythical dimension in religion, we shall have to resist this conflation of myth, symbol, parable and doctrine, without denying that religious truth is often conveyed most graphically by myths and parables. We should have to show that it is possible to state more, more prosaically in non-parabolic form at least something of what was being conveyed pictorially or dramatically in the myths of parables. It can be argued that this is what the early fathers of the Christian church do. I don't know, could you explain that to me, somebody? But that's the sort of thing that we're actually sort of dealing with. And it's interesting that in this book, um, he was actually saying, he said, it's too easy for students to spend their time discussing various commentators and their theories without ever really bothering to examine the text. I follow one minister, a guy called Andrew Warmack. He has dozens of Bible colleges around the world. And for two years, all they do is study the Bible. I think it's a good place to start, isn't it? Not studying doctrine. Now, you may get the impression that I'm not very fond of theologians uh, because they do muddy the water and cause confusion and conflict. And Paul's well aware of that, well aware of that. But we have to remember that in the early church, they had to grapple with all kinds of heresies and wrong teaching. So I thank you for the theologians that gave us the Apostles' Creed, which we read a little while ago. So they are foundational truths that liberal scholars are undermining. I was listening to a, a guy teaching on Hebrews. He spent 20 minutes outlining the various and different theories from different theologians about the authorship and summed it up by saying after 20 minutes, we don't really know. Well, do you know, I know who wrote Hebrews, because you all want to know, don't you? The Holy Spirit. That's all we need to know. So, so Paul is um, instructing people to address some of the problems there. I think he's thinking about these uh, probably Jews uh, who are not very sort of loving. So they were peddling myths, and there are popular myths even in our church today. The Catholic Church say that Mary ascended into heaven like Jesus, that she was a perpetual virgin, none of which is in the Bible. And they get all kinds of uh, genealogies, um, and I think this is what these Jews in there, they wanted to teach the law, but they didn't understand, and they were trying to prove uh, that they were related to Levi priests. They were given to idle talk. They were, I think they were self-seeking, promoting themselves. And that can never be a right motive of service to Christ, can it? Um, he was purely humble, wasn't he? Leaving heaven and clothed in flesh. So Paul is saying he didn't understand uh, what they were talking about. And I think if you look at the Ephesian church, that lack of love, in, within two centuries that church had closed down. Was in Ephesians they were told that the, there was a lack of love in that church. And at the end of this, it gives an insight. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the teaching that are caused to godlessness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicion and constant friction among people who, are, who have depraved, are depraved in mind and de deprived of the truth. Imagine that godliness is a means of gain. And I think a lot of surgeons, a lot of theologians and a lot of false teachers would fit into that. But we, no, we believe that the law is good. It's ready for us today. Uh, we, in chapter 15 of Genesis, it says, and, 
and about Abraham and he believed in the Lord and it, he, it, he accounted to him as righteousness. Now we all know that we are sinners, don't we? And there's that call to repent of those sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you know that, you are saved. And the wonderful thing is that when you come to faith in Jesus, you're no longer a dirt and dirty, rotten sinner, but you're a child of God, adopted into his family and seen as holy, righteous and sinless in his eyes. You know, and I think you know, I meet many good people. They believe that leading a good life, going to church, praying, reading the Bible, being generous with their money, giving their time in serving in church, will earn them a place in heaven. But that's not the case, is it? Salvation cannot be earned. It's a sovereign gift of God's grace. It's by grace that we are saved. You know, and those that in any leadership position want to see us all mature in Christ. And I hope that's your desire. And what and that you're taking steps to develop your Christian faith. So can I suggest you encourage you to get to know your Bible better? And that would include time devoting time to reading it, studying it and meditating on it. It would come it include coming to as many services as you can, sourcing good sound teachers. I mean I've been a disciple of um, Yeshua for 43 years and I'm still learning. You never stop learning. I keep a little book and I write down things that I, I learn and I re review them from time to time. And I always approach the word with anticipation that the Holy Spirit is going to reveal something new to me. I hope you're, you're the same. And a great place to learn is home groups. So if you don't attend one, can you make that a point thinking about uh, next, well, from September onwards, make that an aim for yourself to become to join a home group. Make a point of coming to prayer meetings. And prayer should be the powerhouse of the ministry. It's great to have people with us this morning. Do you know, and I attend as many prayer meetings as I can. Veronica and I pray every morning. <clears throat> the Love Shrub Love Shrub End team that I'm part of, we pray every morning on Zoom and sometimes in person. You'll find me at prayer for Stanway, prayer for Colchester, and that's in addition to my own prayer times. So can I encourage you to be praying people? It's so important for a church. And the Bible also tells us that uh, God has prepared good works for us to, to serve and has given us spiritual gifts to, to, to each and every one of us. So we need to tap into God's treasure house of God. So how can you contribute to the life of the church? What gifts and talents can you use to build up this fellowship? And I know many and many of you do and many in unseen ways. And just allow the love of Christ to be the dominating force in your life and begin to enjoy all the supernatural fruit of the Holy Spirit. Supernatural joy, supernatural peace, supernatural love, supernatural patience, supernatural kindness, supernatural goodness, supernatural faithfulness, supernatural gentleness, supernatural self-control and against those things there is no law amen let me just pray father god we thank you for your eternal word we thank you that the work of the holy spirit is to lead us into all truth and we thank you father for this church that faithfully proclaims your word week in and week out and I pray, Lord God, you help us to grow in our knowledge and understanding of you, to really appreciate the wonderful love that you have for each and every one of us, and that nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus, and that you are with us always. So continue to build up this church, that it will impact this community for the sake of your gospel and for the glory of your name. Amen.